So um, I'm Jane Helmstetter, and I'm the, the facilitator for the meeting this evening and for the uh, Chittenden County Homeless Alliance. And um, uh, why don't we go around this way and introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Marcella Gange. Um, I work at SUDO at the City of Burlington, and I work mostly uh, on that collaborative application for the COC and with our permanent supported housing firm as well. Here's the very minutes finalists. I'm Chanel. Um, I work with Marcella at CEDO. I'm the acting um, CCA person. Jenny Davis, I'm the Dutch Champagne Valley School District. Elizabeth Gilding, United Ways of Vermont, and Vermont Community. And then, so we're going to work with Helen Stone. John Fitzgerald, Committee on Temporary Shelters. Stephanie Smith, uh, Coordinated Entry. Harry Duke Hoffman, Agency of Human Services. Um, oh, oh, yes, you had an announcement. Uh, yeah, and Please. I have a quick announcement, which is the Outreach and Membership Committee pulled together this list of uh, acronyms, and I'd love to pass this out for two reasons. One is we're trying to make our meeting more inviting, and if you, uh, so even if you know all the acronyms, uh, if you could correct the things that we get off, we put sort of plain language definition best we could from what we could find online, so uh, edits are super welcome. So just, and, and Kerry is the uh, acronym buster. So if if somebody says something that she doesn't think everybody knows about, she will uh, call them out on it. Thank you. <laughs> We're doing announcements. If you have something, okay. yes. yes. Um, my name is Jason Bro. I'm a social worker with the Department of Veterans Affairs and also the chair of the statewide Vermont Veterans Committee on Homelessness. And two quick announcements. Um, one is we have a permanent support of housing program PSH uh, which is referred to as the HUD VASH program uh, there's a of some acronyms here uh, US Department of Housing and Urban Development VASH stands for Veterans Affairs Supportive Housing uh, we have uh, that program runs statewide throughout Vermont and also the four counties in New Hampshire that we cover uh, as of last Friday that program is currently uh, on pause for any referrals or new admissions to the HUD VASH program uh, for a number of reasons uh, one is uh, largely like many agencies are suffering from for uh, staffing capacity issues with current vacancies and some very soon to be vacant uh, positions uh, in different regions in Vermont and so we have had to make the decision to that referrals uh, for the VASH program on pause for the time being um, and also, um, we have a number of veterans that are being supported in the program who are currently homeless and in search of housing and others who have unfortunately returned to homelessness uh, after being housed that are being supported in that program throughout the state. So I'll update this group uh, when referrals and admissions to that program uh, restarts. And then the other piece of that is around staffing announcements. We have two job postings currently posted. I did send them out to the listserv the other day. Uh, if you have any questions, about either of those positions. One of them is based in White River Junction. The other one is based here in Burlington. Uh, and I'm happy to talk with anybody who is interested or might know somebody who's interested in either one of those two positions. Thank you. Hi, uh, Will Villardo. I'm with SSVF for the University of Vermont and the Veterans Committee on Any Veterans Homeless for the State of Vermont. Hi, everyone. My name is Kate Panera. I'm a Community Support Liaison for the Department. Hi, everyone. I'm Aaron Rolfing, Director of Veterans Service Coordination at AIDS Law. Uh, Stephanie Bixby, the Director of Rental Assistance for the Burlington Housing Authority. Hey, um, Taylor Tebow, Champlain Housing Trust. Uh, Will Town, Spectrum Youth Family Services. And the co-chair of the Shane County Homeless Alliance. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, sir. I'm Sarah Russell uh, with the City of Burlington and the co-chair of the Shane County Homeless Alliance. Thank you. And you have one question now. Yeah. Um, so we have uh, stipends for any folks who lived experience apparently since we were coming to the meeting. Um, and um, I, there we are, there's Travis Pruden waiting in the corner. Um, if anyone just wants to go and uh, speak to Travis, then uh, we'll be able to organize stipend and um are we gonna go around the back of well, sure yep. you are indeed yeah i'll start uh miles mcgerman i'm here from senator welch's office tip only i'm a state rep from uh the south end of burlington uh, noah Harmon, uh representative from south burlington <laughs> most of all the human services um state rep kate logan from burlington old north end and downtown um, and also the director for the vermont coalition of runaway and homeless youth programs 
Like in every South Burlington City Council. Like Alex Melville, interested citizen. Sorry, not this Interested citizen, educator. Barbara Ross, South Burlington resident. Alice Moore, you're here in Melville. Megan Bridges, and I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow. Megan Bridges, I'm going to go to the office tomorrow.
of the CCHA for um, reviewing the NOFO and then reviewing the applications for funding that we're applying for within the NOFO. Um, the, I'm not a voting member of it because we receive some of the funding, but um, um, I kind of staff the committee. Uh, so we ha sent out a, a notice to see um, who would like to join our fabulous ranking subcommittee, and, and I had some sturdy volunteers. Um, New and ones. Th and th yes, and thank everyone. So we're basically with this motion just voting to accept that membership for this year. Uh, and those are really the, um, the only updates in this policy is the, just the membership and the dates. Um, if when a HUD releases the NOFO, we need to amend our prioritizations, um, then we'll come back to you with that, but we just want to kind of to get this piece out of the way so we can move forward. So um, the motion, uh, the vote that, that we're asking folks to vote on tonight is the CCHA Ranking Committee requests approval from the CCHA Steering Committee to accept the amendments to the ranking policy and procedures. The release of the FY23 NOFO may require changes to the HUD and CCHA policy priorities and any changes will be returned to the Steering Committee for approval. Um, if I could get a first and a second. Are you making the motion? No, no. Sarah. Okay. Sarah made the motion. Is there a second? Thank you. Uh, did you get that? Yes. Thank you. Oh, is there any further discussion? And this was sent out, so folks probably have read through it thoroughly. It's all good? Excellent. Um, I'd love to have folks who are all in favor raise their cards. It looks like 18. Any opposed? Abstentions. Thanks. And we're always happy to answer questions if anyone has any questions about the hard notice of funding opportunity that comes out of you. Thank you. Um, Strategic Planning Committee, uh, Nicole and Sarah. Do you want me to go? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the Strategic Planning Committee has been plugging along with uh, development of our uh, five-year strategic plan. And um, the most recent, we have been a little bit stalled because of um, all that has been happening. Um, we did get a um, no cost um, extension from Diana, thankfully, um, our consultant that we've been working with uh, to continue this work into June. Um, most recently, we, we have uh, finished just about our um, outreach uh, to, uh, we held focus groups, a lot of you attended those, um, and we also um, have done some outreach to people with lived experience um, and are working on compiling those um, those notes. We actually um, had really kind of amazing turnaround. A turnout. We did a lot of outreach to people with lived experience at meals around um, around, and I would say probably got feedback from nearly fifty people with lived experience, which I think is pretty impressive. Um, so we're working on compiling those. Um, those notes to inform our priorities, and then we'll be hopefully presenting um, those priorities within our uh, new strategic plan at our meeting um, next month. Anything to add? That's perfect. Perfect. Does people have questions? Do you think that this will be ready to uh, present? What do you guys think? We're about? hoping to present a draft at the steering committee in um, July. July, okay. Um, so we're in the home stretch um, and needed a little bit of extra time to, to do the, the actual outreach component um, and wanted to make sure we you know did a really robust effort to connect with the uh, people have lived experience. Great. So. Thank you. I know there's been a lot of work done on that. And for people who also don't know, regularly we meet on Thursday mornings, the, the first Thursday of the month uh, at, at City Hall in Burlington from 8.30 to 10.30. Nine, nine, nine to eleven. Don't come at eight thirty. Dana will be there. So. I will be there at eight thirty. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, emergency motel update. I think this is one that many people are interested in hearing, and um, I understand the commissioner might have come tonight, but something came up. So we have Terry Duquette Hoffman. Thanks. who is the field director for the agency in Chittenden County and represents the state. And thank you for um, sharing an update. 
thanks for having me. Um, so I'm just a few disclaimers as we start. And well, sorry, it's a little hard to see there, huh? Um, uh, I work I work for the Agency of Human Services. The Department of Children and Families is one of our six departments. Um, so when I, I'm sure folks will have questions, I'll do my best to answer them. I won't know all of the uh, answers for um, specific Department of Children and Families uh, policy, uh, but but I'll I'll find them and get back to you. Um, and I also want to just mention, because this is a public meeting and a community meeting, I started uh, a little bit more basic, so uh, uh, I'm not meaning to be redundant with folks who've been in 85 meetings with me and <laughs> have heard this a lot of times. Um, uh, I, so just as a, a foundation here, that emergency and general assistance program is run through the Department of Children and Families, and it's, it's existed in Vermont for several decades. Um, one of these pro one part of this program is the hotel program. Um, this program uh, during the pandemic grew from a program that served a couple hundred people to a program that served a few thousand people. Um, the goal during the pandemic was really to ensure that people were housed and that people were housed independently. Um, so really uh, there was you know, a, a reduction of congregate shelter environments. Um, the program is a, uh, is a program of last resort and it is a shelter first program. So folks are only eligible for this program if um, typically if the um, if the shelters are full or if there's some reason why um, the shelter environment would not work for them um, I know many of you know this very well um, <sighs> Sorry. Uh, and then I also just want to say, like, just personally, and, and I think I can extend this uh, for our whole agency, um, the ending of this program has huge impacts on communities. Because one of the things we saw with this expanded pandemic program is that homelessness is a much bigger problem in our state than we realized. Um, so this program really shed a light on that. Um, Going forward, um, the, the program during the, the pandemic was mostly funded uh, through federal funds that have ended now. The legislature has made a, has voted to return to uh, the pre-pandemic levels of funding, which means that the program is radically restricted. Um, I also really impact that I, I understand that this has a huge impact on children and families, and, and especially the Department of Children and Families is very aware of the impact that this has had. So if you want to go to the next slide. Um, I want to first point out uh, there's a, this uh, website, which I'm sorry, I should have made the font a little bigger now, I'm realizing. Um, this website is a website that the Department of Children and Families has pulled together with um, in, um, you know, if you want to click on it, I don't know if that's possible, but um, with resource updated data, weekly updated data, um, policies are changing by the minute right now, and so updated policies. Um, and then also, um, this has just uh, general updates about the program and uh, and and. Um, different uh, work that's being done to address homelessness um, in, uh, by the agency. Um, a couple of things that I'll highlight, and, and this, for, for those who've heard me a million times, uh, some of these are, are kind of new, um, which uh, is that um, there is a relatively new to me um, policy that I've just learned about that on July 1st, any um, households who have housing vouchers will actually be given 120 days in the motel to find um, to find housing. So not the 28 or 84, but 120. Um, the difference in days of eligibility uh, can be found on here. Uh, if you scroll down, Chanel, a little bit, um, this is a question question that I've got, sorry, a little bit more. <laughs> uh, this is a question that I've gotten a number of times. That, you know, how do I know if the person, I'm a little bit more, sorry. Uh, a little bit more, there we go. How do I know if the person, a uh, little bit more, sorry. Um, how do I know if the person I'm working with is eligible for a 28-day stay or an 84-day stay? Um, and this um, highlights the category of eligibility that folks who fall into um, to give those two 
stays. Um, so just wanted to mention that to folks. If you're not sure what category the person you're working with is in economic services or I often can help you figure out what category they're currently in. One thing to say you know, about categories is for the last uh, two years, people have been it, um, entered in the category that's kind of <coughs> easiest to document, right? So um, it's hard to document that the a person has been um, evicted under a cat catastrophic category because that involves court paperwork often. Um, so a person might be documented under another category, but eligible for that category. So that is one thing that economic services is working to do to update that, but if you're working with someone and you feel like that they're not documented in the right category, or if you are someone who feel like that's not my category, um, please do reach out to economic services. And if you can't connect with economic services, do feel to, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and let's see, what else do I want to make sure to say? And then another big change that I think most folks are aware of, but I want to just make sure, is that on July 1st, um, folks will be asked to contribute 30% of their income towards um, housing again, towards the hotel stay again. They're um, at the end of this PowerPoint, uh, and I think we're going to send this out, Chanel, is that true? OK, there's a link to the GA rules, because there's basically a chart um, that says, like, if you're a family of this size, um, you know, anything under this amount won't be, um, like, um, considered in that payment towards your housing and, and that changes depending on the, the household size um, but that's just a little information about that um, sorry try not to go too long here and then a little bit of data because I think that's what why what we wanted here so um, approximately 140 households had their stays um, through economic services no longer paid for um, uh, on June 1st the that was folks who were in a hotel under the adverse weather category um, that some folks you know are still in the hotels some folks have left um, it, it seems um, so that 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 has happened um, of the folks remaining in the cat in um, in hotels in Chittenden County um, you can see here uh, as of um, six five I believe this data is from there's 213 households um, that represents um, 68 families with a total of 100 121 children um, and then uh, as you can see on July 1st um, of those 213 households 94 will receive 28 days of housing of, of hotel stay paid for through um, economic services and 114 will receive 84 days of housing paid for, for through economic services so you know a, a, a side note on that any housing that someone pays for themselves in that period uh, doesn't count towards those 28 or 84 days. Um, just letting people know that. Um, and okay, next slide. Um, so just a, I want to highlight a few efforts that have happened um, in the last few months um, to or the half year really <laughs> more than that now um, to prepare for this transition. Um, the as, as many of you have heard me talk about the teams of folks um, that were a collaboration between folks at the Agency of Human Services and local housing case managers. They uh, began work going to out to hotels working with folks who were in hotels. Um, starting, the, the project started November 1st. I think people started get to, to get to the hotels in December and January. Um, and then um, I, I want to just say that uh, that, pro, that effort, that team-based care effort, um, is going to start to ramp down on July 1. Um, but one of the things that we really learned as an agency from that effort is how um, important that work was. Um, and both the team-based work and the going to where people were. So we, that'll be a key priority in the agency's work going forward. Um, and I just want to um, send a huge shout out to the housing case managers who joined from a number of community agencies, and I'm worried if I uh, list you off, I will forget someone, but you know who you are, and I do too. Um, <laughs> and I, I probably should do it more publicly, sorry. Um, and then um, you can go to the next slide. 
Um, more recently, uh, bringing us to right now, there was a letter of interest memo that went out uh, just a few weeks ago, despite the incredibly short time uh, line and turnaround. Um, we received over 50 letters of interest. Uh, just so you know, that isn't, uh, if you have a project and you're interested in, in putting forward an, a letter of interest, that's a, that June 1st date is a, a soft date, so please do still do get it in. Um, the, so what we're doing with those letters of interest now, I, I don't know how clear this, this was uh, to everyone. So the, the letters of interest were not just to the Agency of Human Services, but rather to state government. So there is a, um, a panel of folks that work across agencies of state government that are looking at the letters. Uh, they started looking at them actually this week. Um, so our communities, I, I do know that Chittenden County is you know top of the list to look at our letters of interest. So we should hear from folks pretty soon on those letters of interest. Um, yeah, that's what I was, that's that. Yes. <laughs> yep, absolutely. And then the other piece that if you want to, Chanel, if you want to just go to the next thing. Um, the other piece that we've done is as an agency is put out, this is as an agency, we put out a request for proposal for agencies uh, to support staffing of congregate, semi-congregate, and existing shelters. Those responses are due, due June 11th. One of the things we realized is that A, if we're going to set up congregate shelters, there is not bandwidth, like staffing. You know, we have, we've already talked about staffing shortages in this meeting. Um, and B, um, the, our existing shelters need to have as much uh, support as they can, and uh, that might look like us helping with staffing there. So that RFP is for both existing shelters, currently existing shelters, and any new shelter um, development that's happened, either um, ongoing or short term. Next slide. And I have now, I think, <coughs> gone over my 10 minutes. I apologize. But please reach out uh, with any questions. I put the DCF communications um, list uh, email on there because uh, they'll probably be able to give you really detailed communications. You can always reach out to me as well. And this uh, that is the link to the full general assistance rules with that chart that I highlighted. Thank you. If people have questions, I'm answering them. I do want to Jason. Um, going back to the, um, the piece of information you said was new to you around those with housing vouchers. Yeah. So they still have to meet the, all the other criteria as of 7-1, or is it just if they have a voucher, then they have met criteria? first question let me ask that okay yep and then the other part of that is um, um, the 120 days that they have in the hotel um, does about no, no, never mind I answered myself okay never mind just okay. one question thank you sorry. Okay, I'll get back to you yeah. sorry mm -hmm. yeah. Sarah um, this is really complex <laughs> okay. And that. I'm wondering how this is being communicated to people in motels. Like, are they receiving? Because I know we had heard that some motels, the motel manager actually received the letter. And then, like, sometimes it got passed on to, to guests at the motel. Like, are letters going directly to people in motels? Is it up to you know, case managers to have to decipher this and then share with folks, like how, how are people to know this, especially around this voucher piece, which I feel like is new. And I appreciate your question, Jason. I'm just wondering how do people, how do people navigate this? That's a, that's a great question. And it's an ongoing challenge, to be honest. I, um, one thing that I've heard from the Department of Children and Families is that we do not consistently have updated addresses. So though there have been a lot of um, efforts to mail things out, that often ends up in much later returned mail. So um, you know there are a few different efforts that I think that we've been using. One is the passing things out to hotel managers, as I think many of us have experienced. Some hotel managers are um, able to be very supportive of the folks who were there and uh, in that and that can be variable depending on where you're at um, we are really working to get uh, information out to housing case managers uh, it's constantly changing so I you know our housing case managers are like I just can't speak highly enough of them right uh, y'all actually <laughs> a lot of you in the room um, so uh, that is uh, 
that is one of the strategies we're using. Um, also trying to, you know, push the information out and things like the website, things like that. Um, economic services benefits workers are still going to hotels um, on a rotating daily basis um, and, and trying to meet with uh, everyone they can to check what category are you under, what does that mean. Um, and th that, that's two economic services uh, workers who like just kind of rotate hotel to hotel every day. Um, those are the primary strategies that I'm aware of. Um, I'm sure there are others that I'm missing. I'm wondering if there's a possibility for economic services to provide like TA session to housing case managers so that they can ask all of the questions and feel like they have the knowledge to be able to share with folks. I just feel like there's a lot of things changing and it's hard, like it's hard, it's definitely super hard to keep up. So that's a suggestion I have. Um, the I have another question that I had as we were listening to your presentation is around people with evictions. Like, is that within a certain time frame? If somebody entered the motel program in 2020 due to an eviction, does that like does that still qualify them for the 84 days now, or does the eviction need to be within a particular period of time like is it does that criteria that qualified them to enter the program initially does that still stand i guess is what i'm saying i'll have to find i'll have to ask that okay i, I think okay. it does but I'll have to, i want to make sure about okay. that the other thing i want to mention um i uh this may not meet folks' needs, but Monday morning there there are open office hours that DCF has, and um, all everyone here is is welcome to come to those. So that would be a good venue to ask those questions directly of of the pol like their policymakers and just the uh, so statewide meeting. meeting. It is a statewide meeting. Yeah. Um, yep. The last question I have that I don't know if you can answer this or not, yeah. um, but I feel like I just like need to voice it is that we know that roughly 70 families, households, excuse me, plus maybe give or take were placed out of county. Mm -hmm. And we still have no idea who those families are and don't know what to expect on, on July 1st or uh, 28th or 120 days after that or whatever that might look like. Also for those families that are in motel out of county with vouchers, how will they conduct housing search in Chittenden County if that's where they want to come back to? Like, I think that out of county piece is information that we like desperately need. And I don't know how to get our hands on that. Well, I mean, I, this is a <laughs> this is a very DIY approach. But one thing I'm aware of is the balance of state does track people in like where people want to go in their coordinated entry. So I, we could ask all of the other balances of state and come up with that list. Okay. I mean, all of the other coordinated entries in the balance of state and come up with that list. So there's, so economic services did not, No, that they is not. did not track. So when somebody from Chittenden County had to be relocated to another county, there's no record no. of that. No, there is no record. Okay. You got it all? Yeah. Sure. <laughs> so for the now. link for that meeting on Monday morning, we'll put it in the notes so that people Yes. Um, yes. <coughs> um, Mary, I don't know if you can answer this or not, um, but I, I just want to kind of put it up there. And I know this was just a letter of interest, um, but you did mention there's over 50 potential um, responses to it. And one of the things that I, I didn't see in the letter of interest, and I don't want to make it on the website, but nowhere in it does it talk about a, a dollar cap. You know, yeah. Mm -hmm. How much money is there to spend? If we're talking about the entire state of Vermont, how much money is there to really put towards the issue? That is a great question. So uh, it's kind of a two-part answer. There is <laughs> maybe a three-part answer. Uh, in the vetoed budget, there was a $12,000 earmark that uh, was going to be $12 million. $12,000 would not go very far. A $12 million earmark uh, that um, was for um, the transition in the program. Um, that being said, uh, a that was vetoed, so we, but we do expect there to still be some sort of earmark. Um, that being said, many of these projects uh, that came forward can be funded in other 
places like with existing funds or outside of the agency of human services um, so it's a little bit it's it's hard to come up with an actual um, figure of the available resources because like if some of the projects right fall, kind of fall outside of that we might be able to access other funds does that make sense it's loose, exactly. And proposals are loose in the amount that they're allowed to pay for. Yes, yeah. And very, like they didn't have to, and many of them weren't. Some of them were very detailed and very in the weeds, and some of them were, you know, very big picture. So the, the goal of the LOI was to see, okay, this, this community has this idea. Let's work with this community to make this idea happen. Any other legislators want to Jumping on that? More than 12 million. Okay, okay, okay. Okay, great. Thank you. Might as well, you're here. <laughs> Are there other questions? Yeah, Jason. Hello, question. Sorry. If you remember. Um, <laughs> Um, do you know anything or can you comment at all about the, the like up to $3,300 deposit that some people are supposed to get and how, like as a direct service provider, I've only learned about this from a few media articles. Um, I didn't know it was a thing. I've talked to some of my clients about it um, and they've talked to the hotels who've um, just said like, no, you don't get it. And that was the end of it. Um, but it doesn't feel right because I think they probably should get it. So I don't know if you know, how do we get information about that? of who and how and what the process is. Yeah, okay, so I have a few, like a, 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 a short answer, which is I think it's worth reaching out to economic, economic services if you think the person you're working with is eligible for that and they didn't get it. Um, so it, 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 it was a kind of tricky thing. It was for people who were in the transitional housing program only okay. um, for, at, for at least four months. Um, and it and it had to be really four months um, in one hotel. Um, so if they moved in those four months uh, and weren't in the next hotel for four months, mm -hmm. they aren't eligible. Okay. Um, and that it, but if that was the case, then the hotel needed to either return the money. Uh, so if, if uh, sorry, if that wasn't the case, the hotel needed to return the deposit money to, to economic services. So economic services would have documentation of that. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, if that was the case and they didn't get their their um, deposit money back by the end of April, right? That's when they were supposed to get their money back. I know that many many people didn't get it back till last week, um, but they were supposed like legally supposed to get it back the end of, at the end of April. Um, then they should have gotten a letter indicating the damages that they received. And so um, the Economic Services Office can help folks determine all of that. And local office, they should get in touch yes. with the local, yeah. the local office, local not, office. not yeah. state office. Yeah. You can also email me. I mean, I'm getting a lot of emails. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right, great, thank you. Or copy, that. copy her and write to her. <laughs> <laughs> Any other questions? You know this is a... Yes. Hi, this is Rip Austin. I'm just wondering, do you have a plan A and plan B for if, if the budget passes or if the budget doesn't pass? I I really, I'll have to get back to you on that one. I, I am not, it, um, I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. Karen Kelly on the spot here. Karen is our local okay, yeah. director, so okay. yeah. she just, she's not the one down there making these rules. She's just mm -hmm. here. Yeah. yeah. No, I just didn't know if they were. Yeah. No, it's a really good A's. question. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. The fact that you probably should send it out. So. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> I, I have one yeah, yes. Well. Thank you so much. Um, I can feel badly asking you when I can't see you. Hi. 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 Um, you mentioned uh, Representative Arsenault from Williston. Um, you mentioned that team based care will, will ramp down at, um, on 7 1. And I just don't know what that means. Can you yeah, yeah. flush that out a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um, the hope is that we can transition to local housing case managers as much as possible, and we, we are actively working on that. But what happened with the team-based care is that a benefits worker, several benefits workers um, at Economic Services, several workers from higher ability, and several VCCI nurses um, left their jobs and were backfilled um, either with temp staff or with no one um, to go into the 
motels. Um, they have to go back to their their jobs. Um, so the, that work in the hotels can't continue on the, in the way that it is now. Um, so part of what part of what their effort has been uh, in the last month and a half at least is making sure that everybody's in coordinated entry so they have a chance to have a housing case manager. Um, which is, you know, like many of people, many of the folks in the room who know how challenging that is, um, it, it people come in and out all the time, and right, like I, it, it's a, it's, it, it's hard to, to connect folks, but um, that that's what it's going to look like, like trying to connect folks as much as possible and pass people on. There's lots of triaging, looking at like who more vulnerable folks, and really making sure that we can, you know, build a team. Around around them and things like that. Does that answer your question? Yes, I think so. And so was that put together because there was COVID money to do this? Uh, I, there was no money, <laughs> I don't think. And the data, they must have some significant data from the work that they've done as teaming around some of those clients. I do think so, yes. Yeah. 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 Um, Tip for me from Burlington. Um, I'm just, I'm wondering, does this mean then that all the organizations around this table will be absorbing that responsibility? Yes. 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 And in reality, throughout this, they have had that responsibility, and, and, it, and it is a, an under-resourced system. Yes. Megan Emery, South Burlington City Councilor. I have become aware that there's been a lot of assistance funneling to Burlington. Um, I'm curious to know if there is needed assistance in other communities or if Burlington can truly cover the needs of the people who are seeking housing assistance. I, the, the LOI was available to any municipality in the state to submit a proposal for to access funding support. But is the, is the those that have responded, are they going to meet the need? We have not received any response. So I work for the city of Burlington. We haven't received a response on our LOI at this time. But but this is the So I don't know. <laughs> this this is the Chittenden County homeless alliance. Right. So right. It covers uh, all of Chittenden County. Right. So it, it, the homeless individuals in the other communities mm -hmm. would be part of this as well. Right. Yes. Right. But I'm yeah. and I'm not as close to it as others yeah. as you are, but I, I know that the mayor put out a call for other communities within Chittenden County to step yeah. up their efforts. Yes. And so I just wanted to know more about that need, and if we here in South Burlington yes. uh, could participate, which I am, I'm seeking avenues to do so. Yes, absolutely. So yes. What level of need is there? Okay. So we are. Is there enough yes. support, for instance? Is there are there case managers who could be on site? Is you know that kind of question. Absolutely. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And I would think that we could maybe, um, I think this is an important conversation to have and I really want to have it. And I think that for context, we do have some time at the end of the meeting for forum, but it would be good for you to understand the LOIs that have been submitted. So now we have like the data and you can understand like how we're responding and then we can certainly talk. I think it's an ideal time to talk about gaps, yes. you know, and how we can pull together. Okay. Earlier than, um, but your friends, okay. but your friends will tell you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can watch the time. You can watch the time. Yeah. So just as a follow up on that case management question, because I haven't been in the case management meeting this morning. Um, can you uh, could you just really quickly say um, how many case managers I see our colleagues from Colts over there, and where, and where a lot of the hotel case managers are based from? Like, how many case managers? Do we have across Chittenden County working in all of the hotels across Chittenden County? I know that there's a wait time of six to seven weeks to get case management. And so I'm just wondering kind of also what the gap is as well. Yeah, I think Stephanie has an answer. But can I just quickly say it is not too late, South Burlington, if you want to put it in LOI, it is not too late. It's not too late. So, uh, sorry. Um, I, I don't have the count off the top of my head because there are particular case managers with different roles and there are people who are um, 
uh, have their primary case managers not really housing, but they do operate in that. So I will say out of um, out of cots right now, I believe there are three um, mo um, motel outreach case managers and the supervisor um, covering the motels. Um, there are three um, case managers out of Safe Harbor. There are four out of CBOEO, um, and um, I believe three out of Steps as well. Um, um, four total? Four, yeah. Um, so there are a couple others um, in, other, in other places, um, and they're more at um, covering the shelters at COTS as well, but it's... Um, it's not enough, <laughs> um, and the it really, it really. To be honest, we hold the list of people looking for case management, and it really, it's really unfortunate to be um, not able to connect people seeking services. Um, and it is, we got twenty referrals in the last two days for case management, mm -hmm. um, and only a couple of them were not eligible for it. So it's a, there's a lot of people in a very high need right now. So any additional additional availability and support and um, positions would be more than welcome by the community and by the case managers. And that wait is about six weeks. Ago. Um, I don't know what it is, but it will be going, It will. we did really well at getting it down below, below a month. And then I think now it's going back up again, so. No. Travis, I'm sorry, Eric, Eric, did you want to jump in for Alex? I'm sorry. Uh, oh, you your wondering what LOI. Oh, oh okay. sorry. sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> and I'm the acronym cluster. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. The only thing I was going to say, all case managers, I was representing case managers in this room, certainly know this. Because that um, while well, there is a backlog of folks looking for assistance with housing navigation, the reality is that once you start working with someone, it does not result in housing quickly most of the time. Um, simply because the case managers and the housing navigators can work to get someone ready to rent. We can make certain that they have all the documentation that they need, that they've filled out all the applications for possible subsidized housing opportunities. And there will be this wait um, simply because there is not enough affordable housing to meet the needs of the folks experiencing homelessness or housing instability. I'm aware of the time on this, but this is really important. No, no, it's not your, this is, this is why people came tonight. So thank you for the conversation. And I would ask if there's any other questions before we move on that are burning. And if not, we can come back at the end of the meeting. Yes. Do we, do we have a, an approximate number of the need for safe spaces or beds that we don't have now. Just again. Um, in terms of who doesn't have a, like, who's going to need a bed soon because of the end of the hotels? Is that what you're asking? Or who needs one, like, tonight? Both. Both. Okay, so, um, so you're going to be reviewing the pit. That's the next item. <laughs> yeah, so we can approximate that based off the beds we have versus who we currently have is experiencing the households we have experiencing homelessness. So we can approximate it, but obviously that doesn't mean we have everyone or that you know there's ebbs and flows all the time. But we can definitely get an approximate number of who needs a bed. So let's, shall we shift and talk about the, the point in time pit is the point in time count and uh, oh, sorry, yes. Representative Stone, just for clarification, um, so that number isn't available like on a website or if it is going to become available, like how do we get that well, information? Which number are you actually, just to review the, the, um, Noah's question. So are you, are you asking for the number of people who are unsheltered currently and then the number we anticipate to be unsheltered? Yeah, just try to find the Okay. To so, <clears throat> according to the reports from the outreach workers, we've been meeting with them every other week or so and checking in with them. In Chittenden County, they're seeing around 80 people who are outside unsheltered. There is no shelter capacity. So, there's a lack of, at this point, at least 80 shelter beds. 
We also know that people, you know, may have gotten that three thousand dollars security deposit, and they may be paying somebody to sleep on their couch or their floor, or paying, you know, self-paying in a motel for a little bit since the end of June first. So I think that as time goes on and people no longer have access to that, we're going to see even more people outside who are unsheltered. As far as the data on the twenty-first, what Carrie shared some of that, you know, up here on the screen. I know that that's changing all the time, but according to the data that we have, there was um, about 318 people that would exit the um, that would exit the motel program on the 28th. Now with this. Um, Extension for the uh, voucher for people have vouchers. I don't know how many people have vouchers, so I can't say that. But if we see 300 people exit motel on the 28th, that's going to be the capacity that we have to fill in addition to the yeah, folks who are outside. Yeah. So yeah. hundreds of people. Yeah. And their families, and families children. with children. Uh-huh. Yeah, Just exactly. Children. Uh-huh. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, so, Steph, are you? I believe. Do you have my PowerPoint? I did send it to you, but I can send it to you again. <laughs> so let's start with the point in time count. Yes. Yeah. 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 So yeah. we we have we have many many sources of data um, around. Um, folks experiencing homelessness. Uh, the information that Stephanie has for us is from our coordinated entry system, which is our kind of live ongoing system that's uh, working with folks directly uh, and recording where they are and why needs are. Um, what I'm gonna talk to you very quickly is that something called the point in time count, which is a HUD required count that's conducted once a year um, across the country. Um, and we yes, we published the statewide statewide report on uh, from that <coughs> at our previous uh, Chittenden County. I'm trying really hard not to use any activity. Doing so well. Uh, <laughs> previous Chittenden County Homeless Alliance meetings, we reported on our local, like our Chittenden County count, but this is the statewide report, and we thought it was a useful source of data for for our community to see at this meeting as well so um you can find it you can find all of these all of this information on the ccha website um uh but this is uh this is the 10-year count of um, people experiencing homelessness across the state um the blue line is across the state the orange line is the balance of state which is everywhere but chittenden county and the gray line is the uh, is the Chittenden County line. So you can see what happens in this imperfect count, which is conducted once a year, um, and what, what, you know, what has happened across the last 10 years and um, where we are today as a result of the pandemic. Um, there is a, a small amount of analysis in the reporting of you know, why we think we are where we are, um, which, uh, which I hope will be helpful. So please feel free to take a look at that report and. Um, uh, come back to us with any questions. Could you just scroll, scroll through? There were a couple of things that um, particularly stood out. Um, not yeah, the, next, the next slide. Thank you. So this is our sheltered and unsheltered count. As I said, this is an imperfect count that's conducted, but it's the best we have. Our sheltered numbers are more perfect than they have ever been because we had good reporting because of the number of folks who are staying in the hotels and motels. Um, our unsheltered count in 2021, there was no unsheltered count because of the pandemic and we've been kind of building back up. And we're seeing an increasing number of, within the count of folks who are experiencing homelessness unsheltered. Um, and then the next slide is uh, the fa- uh, families. Um, so this is by household type. Um, and what, what was this was one of the kind of other major points to come out of this year's pink camp was that increase in folk uh, families experiencing homelessness and the Chittenden County numbers for that were with a total household count of 553 households. There were 82 households of, uh, with children experiencing homelessness. Uh, and that's a, you know, you can see we've had a significant increase in those numbers. Um, uh, since, uh, since 
Is there any, anything else to add to that or any questions? Yes, yeah, I do. Yes. Um, I found out really recently about this pit count, and um, what surprised me, and you can tell me if you know your um, graphs fix this somehow, but the pit count is done once a year and it's done in January, correct? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. So if it's done in January, um, most people aren't that are unhoused are not outside because maybe they have um, yeah, mm -hmm. the uh, adverse weather, whatever. Right. So Which it helps us to get a more, a more accurate count because we, we know where they are. are. But, I'm saying, but what I'm saying is this, that then, that then it looks like we don't have many, yes. yep. mm -hmm. many that right. are uh, yes. homeless. Yes. Yes. And people are using that data <laughs> typically once a year, saying, oh, look, Vermont, yeah. they don't have a, So, yeah. So this is the federal requirement to mm -hmm. do this count on this particular day. Mm -hmm. um, we, we know that we need better information about what's happening across the year. So the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance, we have an outreach committee. Um, we bring together outreach workers um, at the moment twice a month um, so that we're kind of doing an informal count at that point it's not it's it, it's not again not a perfect count but you know by by bringing outreach workers together and talking with the folks who are working with folks who are unsheltered or people who are at the uh, community resource center or the the COTS resource center we, we have a better idea from that yeah and you, you're right, Angela. Yes. Yeah, we agree. With it, yes. It is, <laughs> yes. It is also yeah. that anyone who is in motels <laughs> under adverse weather condition or under any GA uh, general assistance um, yes. eligibility, they will be counted during the point in time count uh, because that counts as HUD defined homelessness. But you are correct that, naturally speaking, there may be people who are doubled up because of the weather, perhaps not counted by yes. this process. Yeah. That, and that's always been a, a bit of a flaw, a flaw at the point in time. As uh, Marcella said, it's not a perfect system, but it gives us a one night snapshot. Yeah. And, and we really do rely on much more on our coordinated entry, as she says, passing over to, to Stephanie, yes. because that's our kind of live month to month data and information. But I think it's important for everybody to remember that doubled up by federal federal definition is not homeless. That's right. And and that is a that's a hot hot topic to debate. But if somebody is crashing on somebody's couch, HUD does not define that as homeless. Right. So you so, can't count that. Right. And for those of you who are not like familiar with HUD, this is the funder for our homeless coalitions. We have two we've talked about the Chittenden County Homeless Shots Coalition and the balance of state we have two in this state um, that's where our grant funds uh, come in they have incredible requirements um, that Marcella and her team uh, pull, pull together that we send in for our um, our uh, NOFA request for uh, proposals for for the uh, upcoming year, and the pit count is one of these things that's a requirement for us in order to get funding through HUD. And if anybody's worked with federal grants, you know that as bad as the state ones are, this one is much worse. <laughs> much worse. So um, the coordinated entry, though, if you want to shift to that, if you've got, are you able to? Oh, very close. Okay. Yeah. Uh, it was, I believe it. Let there, you. Are there any other questions before we shift to coordinated entry? Because this is really how we do keep track. Everyone is, everyone we can get into the coordinated entry system in order to find out about what their needs are and, and kind of gear the work with their case managers uh, toward getting what they need specifically. No. Other questions. So the other thing I could do if we're not quite ready for that yet is just to um, flag a, one piece of information that's also on the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance website is um, some resource documents that were put together by the, by the Homeless Alliance for folks who are working in outreach or anyone who's working um, directly with, uh, who may be looking for resources for folks who are experiencing homelessness. So we just had a list of um, bathrooms, uh, toilets, uh, food access, free food access, uh, and where folks can put their tents and uh, camping supplies as well. So that's you could you'll find the links to those on the front of the CCHA website. All right, so. Um, 
I have here the um, a chart um, showing the month-to-month -month count of households enrolled in coordinated entry. Currently, we have 620 households enrolled in uh, in coordinated entry system. Um, over the last year, typically we have gone from in July of last year we had 599 all the way to um, 726 in October, um, and right now it's been pretty steady since last November around 620 households that are enrolled. Uh, so I wanted to just highlight a number of families because that is a uh, population that is particularly vulnerable. Uh, we have currently uh, 69 families as of the end of April enrolled in coordinated entry. Um, this is uh, more of a, a larger number than we had previously. Um, July of last year, there were 46, um, all the way up to 74 in November and December. Um, and currently we are, um, as of April, at 69 households. And families are defined as a household with a minor child, um, so a child under 18 years old. Okay, and then I wanted to show the number of households we had moving into permanent housing over the last year. Um, last year, as you can see, there was very little movement um, to a really <coughs> difficult degree um, moving households into any kind of permanent housing. This year, it's gotten a bit better, um, but it's not anywhere near where we would like it to be. So, around, um, so far this year, we're move, moving in around 20 to 25 households um, every month into permanent housing. That's both through coordinated entry and through other means, through their case managers. Um, in December, the 52 households moving in, that was largely Zephyr Place, um, which we did in collaboration with uh, CHT, Champlain Housing Trust. So, if people have any questions. That's the slide, so questions? Yeah. Yes. Do you do you have, do you have a sense of like houses that are coming on, online like in the next yeah. six months? Yes, yeah. we have. Um, we the. Sarah has a list. <laughs> I do. Yeah, so we track, um, we track the development of homeless dedicated units. And um, in Chittenden County, by the end of 2023, we'll see 112 new homeless dedicated units come online. Um, and we're doing robust outreach efforts to landlords. I know Burlington Housing Authority is working on that. Um, and uh, we're also hoping to uh, bring more homeless dedicated units online um, through the V HIP program, Vermont Home Improvement Program, although to date that's only, I think that's yielded five units in Chittenden County um, with another, I think maybe couple planned so far um, ahead. So um, we do keep track of that. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Um, we are behind it now. It's what we're moving into the letter of interest, which I think is going to um, enlighten. Yeah, don't you? I do. Um, so the LOI or letter of interest that Carrie spoke about, um, we are going to hear presentations from community providers, and I listed. I made the agenda. I listed the ones on here that I knew about. So if one of your agencies is submitting an LOI and it doesn't appear here, I apologize, and we'll make sure that you have time to present um, what you uh, what you have submitted. Um, so we, knowing that the June 1st, originally the June 1st deadline was a hard deadline, um, and now we've learned that it's rolling, which is great um, for folks to get their letters in. Um, but knowing that it was a hard deadline, we wanted to submit a um, 
letter of interest, uh, really a proposal um, to the state to, uh, on behalf of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance. Um, we pulled together um, a group of stakeholders and talked through kind of this idea and what would happen. People certainly provided a you know wealth of input. Um, there was suggestion to include a staff position and you know along with this um, proposal, and it was reviewed you know widely by um, by the stakeholder group that represented. Um, social service uh, or uh, case management providers, housing providers, and um, our designated mental health agency, among others. Um, the proposal that uh, we came up with that was submitted pending uh, final approval at um, our meeting tonight uh, essentially recommends that um, the vulnerable populations uh, in motels, including families with minor children, uh, people receiving hospice or home health um, services, and seniors who are 65 and older, um, extend motel stay uh, until we can house them in a way that is extremely coordinated and rapid. Um, it was a great segue, your question around affordable units. And I think what we need to begin doing that hasn't been done is align the state's emergency response services with the ability of local communities to house and to, and to respond. I think that what we've experienced, I don't want to speak for nonprofits, but I think what we've experienced is that the state makes decisions about when a program is going to end or when it's going to start or who's involved in that program. And it doesn't take into account the work that we do. So every single time that there's a change to this program, the the case managers at all of these agencies have to rapidly learn something new and shift. And so when we talk about the amount of time that it takes to house somebody with those constantly changing regulations, it is impossible to catch up, let alone like redirect, you know, all of your work and, and your caseload. And I think that I guess I want to say, well, we have representatives in the room. I want to say that I think that the work that case managers do is like heroic, like in in all of this. Like there are not direct service providers necessarily here in the room, but I feel like it, we like we need to one of them right there. Like we need to like <laughs> acknowledge that that work is like incredible. And so with this proposal, what we are um, advocating for is that these vulnerable households that would not be would not survive on the streets, right? would not do well in a congregate emergency shelter setting of which we do not have that uh, in Chittenden County right now to extend their stay and then house them in a way that's very strategic and rapid. With those 112 units coming online, we know we can make a really huge dent by prioritizing populations that are in motels and move them out of motels. And I think that that is like, that is the permanent solution that we're advocating for instead of emergency response constantly. If these households, first of all, if they, I can't imagine somebody receiving ongoing home health services from a tent. I can't imagine, you know, par parents trying to raise children and get them to school and bathe them in a locker room and on cots in a gym. And that's just unacceptable. And I think that's that's the spirit of this is that we cannot support unsheltered homelessness for these vulnerable subpopulations. So we're advocating to extend that stay until we can house them. We know that we can do it based on the um, housing data that we have. We know we can house 25 households roughly, 20 to 25 households roughly a month. We know that the units are going to be there because we have new homeless dedicated units coming online in addition to other affordable housing units as they come become available. And um, it's an investment that around 1.7 to $2 million over a five to eight month period, knowing that we've already spent $190 million on this project. Like, let's see it through and get to a place where we can transition households to permanent, <coughs> stable housing. Um, I want to, so that is the proposal. Um, I feel very strongly about this. Um, I hope you all do, do, do as well. Um, we um, so we are also requesting uh, within this proposal um, we have a loose budget together for um, one FTE position uh, to coordinate this whole process. And so what we envision is 
having a spreadsheet, which Stephanie and Carrie have already been working on, that can be filtered instantly. This household needs a subsidy. BHA has the subsidy, but the person needs a unit. Oh, this housing provider has a unit. There we go. You know, and so I think we're seeing this work really pretty rapidly and well coordinated. And I think it's a great opportunity for us to work with in partnership with with AHS, I think. So are there questions about the proposal? Um, or should we, I wanna say that I did have, want to amend our vote. Um, it became, I became aware that um, that the motel pool program that is operated here locally in Chittenden County, um, it would, needs to be included, that those, that those households need to be included in this because they would also lose housing. So um, I talked to Nicole today. <clears throat> There's roughly about eight families or so in that program um, that will lose shelter um, in in 90 days, you know, from their point of entry. And um, so, I'd like to amend um, this prioritization policy to include um, to include all of the all of that that whole pool of, of um, families as well. So, what questions do we have? Yes. I just want to quickly say FTE stands for full time equivalent. Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have we identified the um, the number of households that fit? Mm -hmm. And I'm just curious what that is. Yeah, so we have, um, what well, I guess the data that I submitted, so as Carrie said, the data changes like daily. The data, the data that we submitted within this proposal included 56 families with 115 children. We just heard that that was 68 families with 121 children. Um, the that included, I think, at the time, fifteen people who were sixty-five and older. Um, that included two people who were pregnant but did not were not in their third trimester, um, because that's the qualifier. Um, <laughs> and uh, two, we have two, but we have four. We have four, do we have four pregnant households? I think yeah. Carrie, based on the data that I saw the other day, yeah. um, again, those households are only eligible for twenty eight days in their third trimester. A third trimester is typically not twenty eight days, so I don't know how you budget around that. <laughs> um, I don't know what that looks like exactly. Um, and then we had um, ninety two people with disabilities. Um, and uh, I think 20-ish of those at the time that we submitted this um, had um, home health services and one was receiving hospice care in the motel setting. Again, this is so it's a around fluid, a, it's again, a fluid number. It's a fluid number. So we would so so I think that we would we would need to look at the data again we haven't heard any response from the state and this data does change but at the time that we submitted this we were looking at around 160 ish um, households that we would and that's how we created the budget um, that we submitted to ahs um, the budget reduces the number of households in um in uh reduces the number of households in the hotels incrementally by 20 or we provided two scenarios 20 or 25 households being housed per month to, to recognize that so we've submitted that budget to ahs i'm happy to share the public documents i only have state numbers okay okay any other snacks numbers are coming up tonight okay great yeah Jonathan. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, I have a concern about the prioritization because we have families in shelter mm -hmm. who are employed, working, working on their housing, have vouchers in hand. So I don't want to see them excluded from this process either. Mm -hmm. um, if uh, if they're working hard toward their housing and we're going to ask them to get to the back of the line now, doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. So, just like we want to include folks uh, from SEPs, I would want to include folks from shelter in this CE prioritization. How many families is that? Well, we have 15. 15. At time, we have nine right now. Nine. Okay. And I mean, I think. And as folks yeah. move from, and many of the folks we have in shelter now came from the motel system mm -hmm. because they were seeking mm -hmm. additional support. Mm -hmm. So, as people move out of shelter, 
we're likely if we're going to mm -hmm. fill that spot again, likely with somebody who's in a motel. Correct. I do I'm, want to say the language of that doesn't say they have to be in the motel pool of that vote. It, it, it does say that. It does say that. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, I think Jonathan, I know that COTS has family housing that's coming online this year and only 50% of those units you, we agreed to go through coordinated entry, mm -hmm. which means that the households that you're working with will have exclusive access to those households or to those housing so units. So that's, well, it's it's 50%, right? Yeah. Yeah. Those won't be online until March, right? And okay. February, Great. March. Okay. Shelter stays are limited. Shelter stays are non permanent mm -hmm. housing, so folks can't stay in our shelter for ever. Forever. Right? Right. So, I think this is an important tool, and I would I would ask that we amend this to include you folks from how how long are fam? I mean, my understanding or awareness, I guess, is that um, families <coughs> within your shelters don't have like a concrete exit date so they have so they would in theory have have more time within the shelters we can't keep people in shelter indefinitely we have a 23 family wait list where are those families in the motel which, which, which is great or they're doubled up but if they're in a motel and move into shelter and the prioritization isn't there then mm -hmm. they're going to be stuck in the shelter so we're leaving out the same it's the same demographic we're talking about but the wording excludes families in shelter and i think that's wrong what is the capacity between the two shelters for families? Because I don't think it's that many more households, to be honest. Yeah. So, I mean, the majority of them are already in the hotels. Mm -hmm. And I think if we open up a spot in shelter, we're going to be moving somebody out of the hotel every time we do that. So I think it would have the same impact. I think you also find from a housing pro provider perspective that somebody coming out of shelter historically has had more support mm -hmm. and and they tend to move in with a little bit more support and and do tend to have a more successful tenancy mm -hmm. so you i i think you would see them be able to move quickly and you would see that natural progression of the filtering out of the motel which is the end game of this whole thing right now right it's it's to move so these people don't have to wind up on the street. We're moving them either into permanent housing or we're getting them connected, moving them into shelter to move them into permanent housing. Mm -hmm. That's the whole basis of what we do. So I, I don't disagree with what Jonathan is saying. I do think that there's a way to wrap your shelter families into this and still get your end result of moving people from motels mm -hmm. into, so they still have a roof over their mm -hmm. head of some kind. I'm wondering, Jonathan, as we think about shelter and those units that you have coming online, if what we're talking about is a community-wide coordinated entry system, which I heard you you know, were, were really in favor of, um, with those units, why not make those units available to the entire community as a resource so that then, because I think that makes, that would make sense in alliance with this. This group has already gone through and we've done our MOU for the building that's yeah. going online. That's not the issue here tonight. The issue here tonight is the families that are in shelter not being excluded from this letter. I think it's also the families that are in motels not being excluded from housing resources that are available, that are project based in the They're community. Not excluded. Half are available through CB and half are available through COPS referral. So it's open to everyone. Half is open. Half is open. Yeah, half is open. Yeah. Jason? All of them are open to, to families who need the housing. Right, but not or, utilizing our coordinated entry system that we are on, that you've that you've been advocating yeah, it's not for. That's issue on the table tonight. That issue sells. I think the issue is using community resources for the entire community, and if that's what you're advocating with having shelter guests be like have access the same level of priority that the rest of the community is, which I think is reasonable, then we should be making housing opportunities available to the entire community in the same in the same way. Jason, did you? So, hold that thought, yes. Yeah, it's about this, this the prioritization, so it's, it's related. Thank I do have a question um, going back. I think you had said there was 112 units that were mm -hmm. coming online. Is that, it, are some of those units, uh, well, are they all, there's units that are in that mix that are going to be able to accommodate families, mm -hmm. I would assuming? Okay. Um, 
And then I guess I want to just, I have a question about this proposed prioritization and the impact that it has on the current veterans prioritization that we, that this community has had, yeah. has um, adopted and how that may or may not shift the community aim of achieving functional zero by the end of this year. So I want to know how, how this proposal impacts the current prioritization policy that's in place. Before you answer that, though, I want to just say that I know there was some disagreement and folks had had varying opinions on whether or not prioritization was the right direction to go in. And I'll just say that I, it is 100% the right direction to go in. In December, we had 36 veterans that were experiencing homelessness in Chittenden County. Stephanie and I and Will just met yesterday. We have 18 veterans that are experiencing homelessness in Chittenden County. And I don't have the data right in front of me, but the majority, if not all of them, were housed through the prioritization policy. Um, with another five to six that are waiting, they're approved, they have a voucher, they have an apartment lined up, they're just waiting to get the keys and sign the lease to move in. So we're going to be in the very low teens in less than six months mm -hmm. time from when the last prioritization policy was reviewed. So I just want to put a plug out there that prioritization for population groups works. And we trialed the veterans prioritization policy to see what type of an impact it would have on our community. And we have the data to support to show that it works. And my frame from the very beginning was to try and we have to start somewhere and let's take the information and the lessons learned and apply that to other populations. And that's what we're doing here. Um, and I think it makes good sense. I just want to know how that might impact the current prioritization for veterans. Um, and I think that, um, and I'll just say that I do think that whatever the whatever the answer is of how that might have an impact on the veterans prioritization policy, that I uh, am in full support of shifting if that's the direction to go in to be able to meet the need of the community, seeing that that we have had a positive impact and can learn something from that and really make a difference on other members of the community. So. Thanks, Jason. Thank you. I really appreciate you saying that. I think that our goal with this. And I get to jump in, yeah. you know, for sure. I'm doing all the talking, but our goal with this is to prevent children and families and super vulnerable folks from being unsheltered. And I do think that it's going to trump, it will trump the veteran po prioritization policy that we adopted. And that is really tough because I know that that's something that we have like rallied around and really worked toward. And I, I, I think that we can't, in good faith, allow children and families to become unsheltered. And um, so it would impact that policy, that policy for sure. And it's hard because we're close, right? So I, I hear you on that. And, um, you know, I, I would hope if, if any of the veterans who are in motels fall within these you know, mm -hmm. uh, within these vulnerable population groups, then it would, it, you know, then then they would certainly have, you know, access to that prioritization policy. So, yeah, I just wanted to speak up for the clients that I work with that, you know, uh, for prioritization, it's really important for them. A lot of my clients are disabled, you know, mm -hmm. they have issues with ambulation, and, uh, you know, they really can't go to a congregate shelter. Um, I'm really worried where they're going to end up. They cannot camp, uh, you know, do mobility issues. They can't get into bunk beds. They need ADA rooms. They can't do stairs in a lot of the shelters. That yeah. that's you know that's what they provide. They yeah. wouldn't be able to do that. Um, and so I, I really hope that they could be prioritized to find some kind of help. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. Is that okay? So, just a few clarifying questions. So, when you're ta when you're talking about prioritization, it's not just children and our families with children. It's also it's vulnerable, so vulnerable, vulnerable yes. over sixty five yes. yes. people with mobility yes. issues, etc. Yeah. Um, and then, of all of the people exiting the motel program, how many of them are actually in coordinated entry right now? Because I had a meeting today with Harbor, and I think maybe seven of them aren't currently in CE. Um, so. It, if the prioritization happens, it's through CE. It's yes. only right? through coordinated entry. Okay. That's correct. And I think that, thank you for, for naming that, because that's something that is really clear in our proposal, is that the, is that this this only includes families who are 
engage with case management and who go through coordinated entry. So if a household is not willing to engage in coordinated entry and not, you know, interested in obtaining case management, then there wouldn't, this will only go through coordinated entry. Yeah. That was my follow-up question. Just yeah. Because there are families that aren't interested or yep. folks within the hotel programs yeah. that are not interested in case management. Yep. And it seems like that needs to be a part of yeah. the next step because yeah. to make them successful in Understood. permanent housing. Absolutely. I agree. Yeah. I guess we have a question. <laughs> so it's called, I heard from um, Jennifer Hoffman that there's a lot of housing that doesn't not able to access it. I'm sure some don't want, of course. Yeah. But there are also people who just fall into the cracks. Yeah. And mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I think that we're, t I don't, I can't speak to that because I'm not going to motels. Carrie, maybe um, you could, or, or yeah, sorry. I can speak to that. So we get a list from the state of everybody in the hotels locally, and we do a lot of outreach, um, to people, but it is, um, there, it is really difficult to find some people. Um, we, there are, there's the Cosmo Motel outreach team that's out there. There's other outreach programs. There is one of my staff who goes out to the hotels. Um, we are also supposed to get referrals every time somebody gives permission for us to have their name um, that gets permission for COTS and CBOEO to have their information. And we will reach out to them three times to establish contact and do an intake. We have lots of people who will go to where somebody is. We do, um, like last summer, um, one of my staff was out um, at the beach doing assessments with people camping like we are out in the community and so we do our best to make contact with people where we can um, and we have drop-in hours and all of that kind of thing so it is we are trying really hard I don't know I know that the messaging changed when they go in they're not told to ever reach out they're told they will send a they'll will get a letter um, and I think that's unfortunate because then if they both send a letter um, send the referral to us and they ask people to do out to reach out if something happens and one of the two things doesn't happen they still get connected um, so we do our best. We have, like, I have those lists to go off of. So we, there are people we've made upwards of 10 plus outreach attempts over the course of months. Um, and so we, we do our best with what we have. Um, additionally, I'll say that um, there are people who don't give permission to share their name. So we really do not know that they're that they're out in the hotels we have no way of knowing that um and so they aren't included on the list and they and a referral is not sent our way so there are people who may be out there with no connection to anything um and that's really unfortunate but we can't um force them to engage so but if you are aware or become aware of someone who is seeking Help. Be CBOEO, yes, you can call CBOEO, um, the front desk. Um, there is a referral form also that's fillable on um, in PDF form on the CCHA website under coordinated entry. So you can send a referral directly to us and the email is on the bottom of the form. The email is also set on the website um, and submit directly to us the, like, the person's contact information. Uh, if somebody doesn't have any contact information, the CBOEO CBOEO address is where they should just dro they should drop by um, Mondays through Thursdays. We have drop-in hours, and if we aren't able, to, if somebody's not able to meet with them to do an assessment at that point, we will schedule one for a different time with them right then. So either any of that way of getting connected, um, definitely, yeah. So as soon as they're assessed, they they're entered into the CE system and would get the priority. They don't need to have to wait that six four to six weeks for case management. Not no yeah they they would they would be entered enrolled and be up for particular things. Yeah it it depends on they don't need to wait for case management and we also give information when they do their intake on first steps they can do to that their case manager will start with them once they're engaged with case management um which includes things like getting ids um and you know applications if they're interested in an application we can put that off and get them to them as well so 
if I could just add to that, taking some of the things that we have learned from the veterans prioritization policy, that um, the first six months of the policy really were useless, I mean, to, to put it bluntly, with the veterans prioritization because um, there's, you know, we have the phase system and through coordinate entry and folks need to be added to the unit queue, um, you know, for, for certain types of resources. And that wasn't happening for our veteran population. And so the, I think there, there does need to be some level of work. Yes, there people folks would get prioritized. Um, by being in coordinated entry, but they also have to go through some of those other steps through CHRC, Community Housing Review Committee, to be able to get to that place where their name gets pulled from the list and plugged, to, plugged into a housing opportunity. Um, and and so whatever that looks like, they're, they're, they're one of the things that, that was really a detriment to the veterans prioritization policy not being as successful as it is now at the very beginning was because um, the veterans were not moving through those phases and were not getting added to the unit queue at the at the early stage that they needed to. So whoever is doing that, whether it's the, the clients in the hotels themselves or support staff that are dedicated to, to helping them move through those phases as quickly as possible, that's really what makes the prioritization work and, and what makes it successful. Yeah. It's We can set the policy, whatever that policy looks like here today, um, but there's still some other additional work that needs to make it actually work for the client. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you, Jason. And I thank you for what you said earlier. Um, I think when we are looking at this, this is truly a community issue. And when we talk about prioritization, as we have with veterans, it does mean that other populations are going to be slightly deprioritized. Um, but I think, you know, we can all agree that we can't have 121 children sleeping on the streets at the you know, end of July. So I think we're asking a lot from the state, right? And we just, we need to get on the same page as a continuum of care here and really like all be bought into what we're gonna do here. So it seems to me that at least I haven't heard any disagreement about um, that aspect of things. What we're talking about is the scope of the prioritization and where we cut it off, Elaine. No, I just wanted to mention that. I think you have a valid choice about how to sleep in shelter families. Um, so I'm, I just want to put that out there. Um, I'm not sure I understand the objection to that. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I don't think that there is an yeah. I, Nicole? Um, I'm. I'm just thinking about that. And I think one of the things that we're navigating right now is flexibility and being able to respond to families' needs also when we're talking about this. So, you know, with ESD programming ending, there's like a hard and fast date for that, which we're trying to advocate for more. And hence the prioritization, because that date isn't necessarily going to get extended just because we're advocating for it. And that's one of our limitations also in our motel pool funding is we have to have consistent exit like those stays for folks and a specific amount of money to pay for that programming. And so that is one of the reasons why I was advocating as well is because it's kind of that same space. Whereas when folks are in shelter, it is definitely not a permanent housing option, but we can engage and be more flexible and supportive when we have that, that autonomy. Um, and that's just hard, I think, to navigate when you're looking at state funds and state regulations. And so prioritizing folks who are going to be impacted by that does make sense to me. So I, I, we haven't resolved this, what we're talking about over here. Uh, I just, I would ask, what would it take? Would it be enrolling in coordinated entry, these uh, the families to be in, in, engaged in, or in, in coordinated entry and then uh, doing the same assessment that the other families who are in hotels are doing with that? I think it's every, I think it's definitely through coordinated entry. I think what, I don't, I don't think that it's, that families from shelter should be excluded. I don't think anybody is disagreeing with that. I think what I'm, what, I guess where I'm coming from is that if we're going to include all of these folks in a community-wide system for prioritization through coordinated mm -hmm. entry, I think that I would I would like to ask Cots if you are willing to also include all of the units in that family development in coordinated entry so that the whole community has access to those as well. That that feels like coordination. And so I guess that would be my 
request is that I know that we signed that MOU, but you have the you have the decision making, <laughs> you know, to to change that, you know. And I think if we're looking at all of the families accessing all of the resources available in the same way, then it makes then it makes sense for all of the families to have access to those to to those resources at that property. So all the families in the family shelter are enrolled in court. Absolutely, we are. Yeah. Oh, great. It doesn't exclude them. It, it opens the way it's working. <laughs> no, I guess what I'm saying is that I think that it's re totally reasonable to include those families in coordinated entry. And my request to you is that can we can we have access to all of those units at the new Main Street family development for all of the all of the families in the community to be able to access those. I can't make that decision tonight because we have a board of directors yes. that I agree right. with. Right, right. And that building has significant non public, you know, privately raised funding. Almost a third of the construction cost is mm. privately raised. Mm. That's why it's happening, right? So I can't just say yes. Okay, well, we'll right. I would love for you to consider that because I think that I think if we're. To the board, yeah. and we consider Great. it, but I can't, I can't make a promise. Right. And, in, in, and when, when individuals and families go through the coordinated entry process and they do the risk assessment, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, they're, people are given a, assigned like a level of risk. And is that not the way that they are then yes. placed into? Yes, that is true. In theory, yeah. yes, except we always change the priorities. So. Well, we're still prioritizing based on vulnerability. Right, it's still vulnerability. It, it, right, it's just a, a category as opposed to the level of vulnerability. Okay. So I guess with all of that in mind, oh, is there more, Jason? Jason? Yes. Yeah. And, and so we had a question over here. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I'm going to make a motion. Yeah. You know, yeah. I think my question is probably related to the motion. Um, so does the actual, does the policy is whatever like the motion is, is that the policy or does the coordinated entry committee have to develop the policy like we did with the veterans pile prioritization policy? It was an actual policy that was presented to this group. This so I guess would be, right. this is putting the car a touch before the horse. I would defer to Stephanie, but we are adopting this policy and then would direct the coordinated entry committee to make it like execute it. it. Yeah. It's, it, there is no way, there's only one way to do it. Yep. So the, like I mean, I can write it up and we can vote on it again, but yeah. it's it's not it's it's yeah it wouldn't change anything. So I will because um, I already yeah it, it is one way to do it yep. based on that. Okay. So we're voting on two separate things here, though. Yeah, right? but we yeah. can't do one without we the can't, other. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah. Sorry, and then I have another question. <laughs> All right, I'm talking a lot. We're gonna get going off the time. Um, so. Whatever the motion is for the prioritization policy, um, as, as you had said, and I, on behalf of the Veterans Committee and in support of it, um, what does that mean in terms of, we don't, nobody has the crystal ball, but like, what does that mean in terms of the future with regard to the veterans prioritization policy? Is, is that something that, comes back to the table for discussion at some point in the future is that like hey we, it worked and it did we learn some things from it and it moves on yeah. yes what is that like? i would say we would need to see like we get through this we see where we're at like if the numbers continue to decrease maybe we don't need it anymore if they go right back up maybe we do so then we would revisit them cool. is that fair mm -hmm. yep. cool thank you oh my yes i just have a quick question um that we haven't touched on and i won't take up too much time but um, in reference to the choices for care and individuals who are receiving home health services um, for prioritization, is it, um, I think I saw that a few different ways, but is it on choices for care and receiving those services or is it eligible for, uh, so, we, so just speaking about uh, older adults who have applied for that program who have met uh, clinical criteria for needing nursing home level care, mm -hmm. often there's a very long delay between that clinical approval and total approval for the program, which is often just processing financial paperwork, so not related to someone's functional need. Um, just wondering how it's stated and how it will reflect um, in that. It would be reflected on people who are in the motel system who are receiving home health care at and, this time. And so receiving home health care, is there any parameter around that? And so one of the difficulties that we have is home health care going into those settings and being able to be consistently serving those individuals, especially when they're switching locations frequently. Um, is there any kind of parameter around that or? 
I don't know if I understand your question. So um, we serve a number of individuals who are older adults who may have had to relocate many different times to different motel settings. So receiving continuous services is not always possible um, given staffing shortages of care. So they have the program, so they're eligible. eligible for the services, so but they may not be consistent eligible. in receiving them, which doesn't mean that they don't have a significant need for those services. They're just not able to be I can carry, 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 yeah, carry. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, uh, okay. Um, this doesn't answer the vote warned thing, and it's a little bit out of order. But I just want to mention that um, that is the this list that um, the pre like the. Um, the list that Dale is working on and that we've asked that, sorry, the Department of Aging and Independent Living is working on um, a specific so right at folks who are either pending um, right, uh, CFC or for folks who've been identified who don't even have applications. And so uh, Department of Aging and Independent yeah, Living is looking at expediting those, assess those clinical assessments. And then Department of Vermont Health Access is looking at expediting those financial assessments. So um, if you can get permission to give me their name, so let's just make sure that I have them because um, I want to, like, regardless of what happens here, right? Like, the hotel isn't the great, it isn't a great environment for people who need help with their ideals. Yeah, absolutely. That was my follow-up question. Was, yeah. If not, I can coordinate that. I sounds like it's already happening. So thank you. Just taking okay. all the words right from my brain. Do you have an answer? I have a thought. A thought. Oh, good. Uh, based on some of the things that we're talking about. Yes. So if if we want to include all of the folks in this list, not just the folks in the hotels, that's what is on the table as well here, right? Yes. Um, can we identify prioritization? Jonathan, you were saying you had a long wait list for folks coming into family shelter. Could they, could folks that are in the motels, are they already prioritized to move into shelter? Yeah, they're, they're prioritized based on the vulnerability. So mm -hmm. it's very, it's not, but motel stay is not. A category in and of itself. Yeah. I just think that that could potentially speak to trying to rapidly get folks out of the shelters and speak to that concern is if, if good. moving out of the shelters means somebody from the motels is moving into the shelter, that could support that. Yep. Would that be a potential? Yeah. Deal. Yeah. Look at that. This is <laughs> action. <laughs> All right. Did you rewrite it? I did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's do. We're, we're gonna we're gonna make a motion. So last question. Yeah. Last question. Yes. I just made sure that I got, I caught what we went. Choices right there. Receiving or eligible. Okay. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. All right. Cool. Is that eligible or eligible? Okay. So I. Not too much uh, detail. Heard, You'll only get yourself. I guess. Uh, so what I need to I need to say the original motion. Yes. Yep. For, and we need to do the prioritization yep. first, mm -hmm. and then we need to do the LOI. And I would say, too, that I'm going to also amend the motion around the prioritization is that that it, if if our LOI isn't approved, I don't know where this leaves us with the, with this prioritization policy. So I, I'm going to say that I think we yes. need to come, depending on the outcome of our proposal to the state, we yes. need to come back to this because if everybody is no longer in the motels on July 28th, then this. Well, if we have 121 so, kids on the yeah. street, we should probably yeah. definitely yeah. prioritize yeah. some. Then we'll be <laughs> prioritizing children who are unsheltered. Yes. yes. Okay. So the original motion I'm going to make is for the prioritization policy. Do you want me to read that and then you read the amendment? And then I will read it okay. as amended. All right. So we are proposing adopting a CE prioritization policy for mainstream resources that focuses on the vulnerability of populations that cannot safely access congregate shelter. These identified populations, families with minor children, households with choices for care, and households 65 plus will be prioritized for mainstream resources ahead of all other populations due to their particular vulnerability within the ESD motel program. And yeah, someone's. Can I make you? Okay. Yeah, well, I would like to make a friendly amendment. No, okay. Somebody, somebody else offered it to you. Oh, so, yes. Okay. Well, I'm going to just say, <laughs> though, I would amend that to the CCHA proposes adopting a coordinated entry prioritization policy for mainstream resources that focuses on the vulnerability of populations that cannot safely access congregate shelter. These identified populations: families with minor children, households who are receiving 
or eligible for home health care and household 65 plus will be prioritized for mainstream resources ahead of all other populations due to their particular vulnerability within the ESD and domestic violence motel program and within family shelter. So that's the change at the end okay. there. So second. All right, so now we have, an, we have a... I, I accept that amendment. Yeah. Thank you. All right, and do we have a second? A second. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> All right, uh, any further discussion? All those in favor? <laughs> Travis almost went through the ceiling. <laughs> I see 16. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Okay. One abstention. Thank you, Carrie. Sorry. Thank you. That was yeah. wonderful. Motion, yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Okay. Uh, and the second so one. The second motion. <laughs> See, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, we're requesting execution of the letter of interest to be submitted, which it already was, to the Defar Vermont Department of Children and <laughs> Families on behalf of the Chittenden County Homeless Alliance in response to that um, ending of the ESD Emergency Motel Program. I make that motion. Okay. Thank you, Travis. Is there a second? I got two of them. Oh. <laughs> Jason, we're going with Jason. I'm sorry, that was fresh. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, all in favor? Sixteen. Uh, opposed? Abstention. One abstention. Karen, thank, thank you. you so much. I just want to say one thing what? before we move on. What? what? <laughs> Is that I really appreciate the conversation that we've had, and I feel like this has brought new perspectives and new Jonathan I totally appreciate you and we may not always agree professionally but I appreciate your perspective always and respect you and I want to say that for the folks who are here for listening to this our, our representatives here I, I hope that you're taking in how horrible these decisions are for us to make and like that we're talking about 56 families and 121 households but there are like there are There's there hundreds are humans. Of other people too. and i think that like prioritizing having to choose between a family in a motel and a family in a shelter or a family i mean it's it's like an impossible decision and so i just want to say like i you know that i i'm really glad that you got to see this tonight because these are like the the really super painful decisions that we have to make all the time. Yes, yeah. So, thank you, thank yep. you, thank you. Um, we hey, have. Thing, I'll just yeah. Quickly describe one thing. Oh, okay. So if you ever have another meeting that you get recorded, um, you have to make sure that you speak period. up, especially in the corners, because if the microphones have a difficult time catching it, that means that these people are probably not hearing what you're saying. The second thing is, right. as far as the camera is concerned. Nobody watching this knows who any of you are. So if you don't say who you are and then make a comment, mm -hmm. then you're basically. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And we we're trying to deal with an administration that yeah. wants this over mm -hmm. and the Senate that is not um, coming to the table. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one third of the government alone can't mm -hmm. yeah. function. Yeah. And that's not how it works. Just yeah. why we have to pool our resources here, correct? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. So yeah. we're trying to figure this out as much yeah. as we can and try to pressure mm -hmm. the administration. Um, I, I have reliable information. There's some more information is coming out very soon. Yeah. Things are fluid. Mm -hmm. um, we know. I mean, none of us are happy about it. Yeah. I wasn't implying that. <laughs> I'm just happy that you're here because I think it humanizes yeah. right. like the work on the ground. You know, no, like, I wasn't yeah. trying to say like, like you guys are doing it. Yeah. I'm just trying to yeah. state facts yeah. and, and yeah. we're all working on yeah. trying to fix it. Yeah. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Is right. All right. Um, this last item, uh, people need to present their. their yeah, just a just a couple. Quick, we're running okay. over, but just a couple minutes each. Just so I think it would be really important for each of the organizations to just give a brief. This is what we're yeah proposing. Just be quick. So at uh, the top of the list is 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 uh, Pathways Vermont. 
Lindsay, what do you got? Do yeah, you want to come <laughs> forward? <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm uh, Lindsay Mays at the Pathways Vermont. And I'll be quick just for folks that don't know our organization, Pathways is a statewide nonprofit organization working to end homelessness using the housing first model and we also do community mental health work throughout uh, our state. We put in a uh, response to the Agency of Human Services letter of interest. Uh, we gave them kind of three options of varying scale. Um, the two that are relevant to this uh, committee's, uh, this continuum's work are, um, we put in, um, essentially we put in expanding our permanent supportive housing network through Housing First, right? So we put in a very large proposal to scale to the ever evolving need in all our communities across the state, which would be reaching into communities that currently don't have any housing first permits for housing to have with, and also um, significantly increasing our capacity in Chittenden County. We really think you know doubling our capacity in Chittenden County would get us a lot closer to supporting um, the households that are in need of our level of support, I'll also say, right? So we can work with households of any side, size. We certainly do work with families with many single adult households as well. Um, and the population that we support in permanent supportive housing are um, folks who are usually exiting really long-term homelessness and also who, for whom like intensive support services, right? Like we do community-based support services indefinitely, you know, long-term um, are the right fit to meet their housing stability needs. Uh, so that was sort of a large proposal. And then we also put in a, smaller and maybe more attractive proposal targeted at Chittenden County um, that would uh, uh, be about half half um, the size and like about a 40 percent additional uh, household capacity um, so yeah we'll let you know as we hear things um, I just want to really 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 say though it's not on the agenda that um, we had talked to you all about um, our proposal with HOP uh, Office of Network um, Economic economic opportunities proposal we have put in for some staffing we talked about it more as an organization and with OEO when we decided to also apply for some rental assistance through that program so we're hopeful outside of this process that we'll be able to have more capacity to serve households with rapid recovery in the future thanks Lindsay. Lindsay. love it uh Sarah do you want to talk about what the city I'm sort of tired now, but <laughs> um, the, uh, so the city of Burlington um, submitted an LOI um, the last week uh, to expand emergency congregate shelter. Um, we uh, proposed a location of 108 Cherry Street, the state office building um, in Burlington, as that was had the closest proximity to services and resources and transportation. Um, we propose operating that until um, we provided an annualized budget. Um, however, that will be prorated as uh, we would transition the wh whoever was not housed in that program, we would transition those folks to um, the adverse weather conditions uh, program uh, in December. Um, so this is a short-term temporary shelter um, to prevent Un, unsheltered homelessness with which we are seeing. We're proposing 50 beds there, which is I, her question uh, is definitely not adequate. <laughs> um, and um, we are also proposing a co-located uh, day station there as well that would be accessible to up to 75 people um, and hope to provide meals um, and could also serve as an additional cooling site within the city during um, the hot summer months. Um, so we uh, do, the city does not um, operate shelter. Um, it is not our expertise, but you're telling me to speak louder. Um, but uh, we would likely, um, if there was not an agency who um, wished to assume operations, uh, we would consider uh, either utilizing uh, one of the proposals that the state received for staffing support um, or contracting with um, a staffing company um, and have set our budget accordingly to that. And as a, a former state employee, I love the idea of 108 Cherry Street. I mean, it's pretty rich, right? Go on, <laughs> <laughs> just want to go on record saying that. Um, thank you. Uh, Travis, you want to talk about CBOEO? Hi. My name is Travis Kula. I work for the Champlain Valley Office of Economic Opportunity. That's the t-shirt. Um, we put in a proposal for $407,000 of us. Uh, from July 1st through June 30th. 
fiscal year um, services at our community resource center. Studio AO currently has a homeless outreach team which consists and fully staffed of eight positions. Two are located um, and provide services primarily at the Elmwood Community Shelter. Three are primarily located at the Community Resource Center, which is co-located with Feeding Chittenden. And then we have two outreach, street outreach, depending on what part of Chittenden County they're in, field outreach staff um, who visit encampments and deliver meals out into the community along with other services. Uh, again, this proposal is to fully fund the four full-time equivalent positions, a coordinator, and then the three positions at the Community Resource Center. The Resource Center is currently serving about 3,600 meals a month between dine-in and take-out, and today, this calendar year, we've served over 1,400 unduplicated households that are using services there. It's both staffing that we're asking for, as well as around $50,000 worth of direct service dollars, which goes to things like feminine hygiene products, basic needs, first aid kits, survival gear, things along those lines to support people experiencing homelessness mm -hmm. as we work with them to try to get them um, ultimately housing opportunities. Thank you, Travis. Um, Crystal's not here, but uh, Steph, you're gonna talk for BHA. I, I'm gonna, I just wanna warn that I do not run the services department at BHA. I run rental assistance, so I'm pinch hitting for Crystal. Um, the Burlington Housing Retention Department put in a uh, LOI for a person to do outreach efforts for people, um, specifically around Burlington Housing Authority's waiting list. Mm -hmm. They can actually physically go out with our laptop and check because they have access if somebody is actively on our website. Um, website on our waiting list, and if they're not, uh, facilitate helping them fill out those applications to get on those waiting lists. They've also been collaborating with Cricket Wireless and Verizon Wireless on getting phones into hands of people who need it, because we're also finding that uh, getting in contact with people is very difficult. And lastly, they're working on a series of workshops to hold for community service, support people, case managers around um, all the work that you do and all the stress and uh, trauma and uh, all the stuff that you have to carry with you um, to help reduce staff burnout as we've seen across uh, Chittenden County. We're losing staff left, right, and center due to just massive burnout from um, everything that you see and have to do on a daily basis. So that was also wrapped into this as well. Cool. I'd also like to just plug to our federal representatives here that you know, if you could really go back and ask for more regular housing choice vouchers for um, our communities, not the boutique ones for people that have to fit in a certain box, it would be super helpful and it would allow us and this body to be a little bit more nimble because a lot of people have to fit into certain little boxes for the subsidies that I have available. And um, one in particular is elderly. I don't have enough vouchers to house elderly people. People mm -hmm. and it really yeah. stinks. Mm -hmm. So I just want to put that plug out there um, selfishly. So thank you. Point. Really good really point. Good point. Yes. Thank you. Wow, applause. <laughs> See if I don't get that. All right, now Taylor, you're up. Taylor, how are you doing? Okay. You're here for for. Uh, I'm I'm generally here, but I don't speak, so I'm just gonna. You can speak today because Mike's not here. So yes. Go ahead. Yeah. Lucky you all. Um, okay, so specific to the LOI is um, it was like an expansion of our current MOU and contract with Economic Services at Harbor Place. So expanding that contract from 30 to 40 rooms, and then we would add an additional. 12 rooms across the street at Harbor West, which was currently, we're, well, we're currently working to reconstruct and demolish, but before we do that, have those available for six to nine months for families that are experiencing homelessness. So would those, would that alleviate, would those families be transitioned from the motel program into those units? I think the idea, and I may be wrong, I think the idea was to expand that to the hotel system. Yeah. So, so the so the households in motels could move into those transitional housing units. Yeah, I guess. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That was my question. Uh, fifty nine. Fifty nine. Yep. Um, and then just an additional side note: there was some um, 
some extra data that I was given. Um, we have 10 units in turnover right now for folks ex that are experiencing homelessness. Um, we have 20 units at Brayburn coming online in September, three at Stewart that are available right now. Um, and then with the VHIP program, Vermont Housing Improvement. Yep. Some program. program. Um, we have 40 units already funded for rehab or new unit creation. Um, and the deadline for completion is 1231, but some will be ready this summer. Um, an additional five in rehab um, that will likely be done by the 21st of December. And then potential for 20 more units that could be funded. Um, yeah. That's, that's great. Thank, Thank you. you. Even more. Yeah. And the Brayburn that you mentioned, those are we've already entered into MLU, um, the steering committee for those units. So those are homeless dedicated yes. units. And those yep. are within the 112 that we talked about as are the steward. Yeah. Yeah. With the VHA subsidy to make them affordable. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. <laughs> they, work, they work very well together. Um, are there questions about any of those presentations? Thank you. We've gone beyond, and I know you're, you're here. No, there we go. Or any other? Yeah, did we miss anyone on the no. agenda? I don't think so. For the LOI? No. no. Okay. Add them all. Oh, wait. You. <laughs> you. <laughs> There's an LOI for more Jennies. You're not a more Jenny. <laughs> Other thoughts. Okay. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. Do you want to say what you're doing? Um, yeah, I actually do. I'll go. Okay. <laughs> uh, thank you for your attention. We can Sorry, hang out. If we're gonna the, the, the camera will go off, and we can hang out here for a little bit of time if people want to chat a little bit. But thank you so much for coming out. This has been, I think, our most successful community meeting ever, and I really do appreciate too. all the work that everyone is doing in this community to help move us toward ending homelessness. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night.